Welcome to these presentations from Family History Month 2023 in Wellington, brought to you by the combined Greater Wellington NZSG branches, Hutt Valley, Colburnie, Hororoa and Wellington. No, my Harry Mai, and welcome to the first of four presentations for Family History Month that are being put on by the combined Greater Wellington branches of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. And you don't want to say that one too fast. I'm Sarah Hewitt. I'm convener of Kilburnie branch, which interestingly enough is in Kilburnie. I'm also chair of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. So tonight I'm going to be speaking on starting your genealogical journey. When I was, well, much younger than I am now, my grandfather over there with his fish used to tell me some of the stories about his family. And one of them that he told me was about his grandfather, my great great grandfather, Robert William Black, how he was the first man to import Panama hats into New Zealand. Now, I debunked this in about mm, 30 seconds on papers past. But there was a step that I missed out if I was using that as a starting point for my genealogy. Now, I know there's a few old hands in the audience tonight. So who do we start our family history with? That's right. You start it with yourself. Now, there's two really good reasons why we start with ourselves. The first one is to get people's official names. So this photo was recently given to me by my uncle. It has my great grandparents, Alf and Greta, with their three grown children, their three in-laws, children-in-laws, and their first little grandson. On the back of this photo, it quite clearly says that my grandfather, my other grandfather, is called Bill. However, if I start looking for records for Bill and Lorna Hewitt, I will find some, but they're not mine because when I travel up the tree from me to my dad, to my grandfather, we discover that his name was Walter. It's something to do with the initial W, which is why he was called Bill. And it has caused a bit of confusion. That small child in the picture himself told me that he remembered it being Uncle Bill and never Uncle Walter. The second reason is to make sure that we have the official relationships of people. Now, this lovely photograph was given to me by my O'Callaghan cousins. It's my three times great uncle, Arthur Pine O'Callaghan, with his wife, Florence. It's believed to be taken on their 50th wedding anniversary. However, if you take this as a starting point and think that Arthur and Florence are your ancestors, you might go astray because while she died tragically young, Arthur's first wife, Dorothea, managed to have three children before she died, all of whom grew to adulthood and all of whom had children of their own. So by Following from ourselves, we get people's official names and the official relationships. And that's why we need to start with ourselves. And it's pretty simple. In this day and age, we need to find our birth certificate. It should have details of our parents. And I am kind of glossing over the whole illegitimacy and adoption element here. Those details should give us our parents' marriage certificate, which will give some details of their parents which will lead to your parents' birth certificates, more details about your grandparents and their marriage certificate and onwards and backwards. But this, this is just the skeleton of your family tree. You want to know more about it. And I'm very big that you want to talk about the stories of your family. You want to know what they did for a living. Where did they live? How did they get to New Zealand? And what about those Panama hats? Going back to those Panama hats, as I mentioned previously, it took me about 30 seconds to debunk that. I went into papers past, put Panama hats in a search with inverted commas around it, and I found an article in 1841. Now, the story about Robert William Black started in 1872. How did it start? Well, he was sent from Christchurch, New Zealand, back to Ireland to get married. His bride would have been about 11 years old when he left Ireland, so it was definitely an arranged marriage. The records that I found on Papers Pass show that he took a coastal ship up from Christchurch to Auckland, and from there he caught the mail clipper, the Nebraska to San Francisco. After that, there's not too many records, but given the Panama hat story, we have to assume that he went to Panama. And from there through the canal. Well, maybe not. 
For the longest time, I thought that he'd just gone through the canal like my mum had in the, 1850s, in the 1950s. But actually, Robert William Black was about 30 years too early for the Panama Canal. So how did he get across? He took the train. I have to say that I think it would have been a really uncomfortable journey. It would have been hot, muggy, no air conditioning, lots of bugs and other things that wanted to bite you and kill you. And to this day, you can still take the tourist train across the Isthmus of Panama if you so desire. Where he went to from there, I do not know. There was at that point a mail run from San Francisco to New York through across through the train. But we know he got to Ireland, he got married, he caught the ship Bangalore back to Melbourne and then back onto New Zealand. So he didn't have, he wasn't the first person to import Panama hats to New Zealand, but he was my first ancestor to circumnavigate the world one and a half times. And as someone who gets terribly, terribly seasick, I have to admire his fortitude because I would not be doing it. Give me a plane any day. Now, I'm gonna take off my Panama hat now and put on my hat as chair of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists, the NZSG. And, but before I get into the resources that we can provide you when you're getting started with your family tree, I like to put this up here. Here there be dragons. Dragons are creatures that can leave you feeling a little bit singed or burnt to a crisp. And we've seen in recent years what DNA can produce in terms of outcomes that were not anticipated in our family history. But DNA is not the only thing that can leave you feeling a bit singed or burnt to a crisp. You may find records in your research that, well, you just don't like. Things that change your impressions of members of your family that you'd heard stories of or that you'd admired or even people that you knew. So I like to put it out there that there may be some dragons in your family tree. Just don't forget they might be there. And on that happy note, let's move on to the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. What are we? Well, there's quite a lot in our name. New Zealand, we are the National Genealogical Organisation, which when you start researching out of side of New Zealand, you will realise is very valuable to have a national organisation. We are a society, a membership society. We have three staff to do our administrative things, but everything else is done by volunteers, from myself on the board, through our branches and all our resources and collections. They're all done by volunteers. And last of all, we're genealogists, and hopefully we represent the best of genealogy and that we are friendly, collaborative and helpful. We have four pillars. I keep trying to think of a different word to our strategic plan, but I think it pretty much encompasses what the NZSG is about. Advocacy, communicate, community, education and information. I'm going to sort of gloss over advocacy because when you're starting out, you probably don't really care what we're advocating. You're more interested in getting started on your family tree. First thing you need to think about is what are you doing? A lot of people talk about we're doing our family tree, but what does it mean to do your family tree? So we have some great resources on our website, called Getting It Right, that will give you a starting point. One set of the resources has the snappy title of Starting Your Genealogical Journey. And if you look on our website under resources and then research skills, you'll find a whole pile of information, not just for those of you who are getting started, but for anybody who is doing genealogical research. All of these are open to people who are not members. Now you might find that something online that you have to watch a video or read some notes on is not quite your thing. You want the interaction of a class. We have an introduction to family history course that we run both in line, online and at our Family Research Centre in Pamir in Auckland. So obviously, if you're here in Wellington, the online class is probably more what you'd like to do. After that, if you still need some help or you want to get out and meet your family genealogists, it's time to think about joining an NZSG branch. So the presentations here for Family History Month are brought to you by the combined Greater Wellington branches. And in alphabetical order, they are Hutt Valley, Kilburnie, Parirua, and Wellington. And there's members from all those branches here tonight. So if you're thinking about joining a branch, 
do ask around and have a chat with us. We're always very happy to talk to you. We are at the NZSG also starting to build more online communities. We have an online writing and publishing group. We're about to launch a DNA group. And we also know that there is the option out there that if you have an idea, if you have a sort of niche area of your family history that you won't find enough people in a physical location, that maybe an online group we can start uh, putting together for you. So never be afraid to come and ask and see what we can do. We also are now running monthly presentations on the last Thursday of the month, month where we have a chat, have a presentation. We've done a lot of these since last, last Family History Month was the first one, and they are all available on our website. There's some great ones that talk about various aspects of using the NZSG resources in there that you might like to watch. Now, of course, once you've figured out what you're doing, you're going, where are those records, Sarah? I need some help with some records. Well, let's start off with the Family Research Centre. It's in Pamir in Auckland and it holds our library. The library contains about 62,000 items, a large number of them are books, but there are also various databases on CD-ROMs. We also have access to all the library editions of various uh, commercial websites. And of course, the big question I always get asked, but it's in Auckland, Sarah. Well, actually, it's just an email away. We have a great team of volunteers up at the FRC who answer your research questions. And so by getting in touch with research services, you'll appreciate that the FRC is not just for Aucklanders and they can look up anything that we have in the FRC. You might wanna check whether a book you want to borrow has actually got your family in it before you fork out for the postage. They can go and check for you. And because it's a person on the other end of it, you might get that value add advice of, what well, have you thought of looking here or there? or we have these records, have you looked at those yet? So research services is a great way to get help from your, for your family tree. And if you want to find out what we have in the library, then you need to talk to the library cat, a log. Our library cat has her own web page where she highlights some of the collections of different books with a theme that we have in the library. But the catalog is open to everybody. You don't need to be a member to have a look. And it covers a huge array of resources. We are not just New Zealand focused in the library. We have the library of our English interest group and our Scottish interest group, although you need to be a member of the Scottish one to borrow their books. But there is a wide variety of books. And in fact, I was looking the other night to see what they might have on China. And we do actually have quite a few things on China. So you never know what you're gonna find until you go looking. A really sort of random question that I sent up to research services was a couple of years back when I was going to go to the Auckland Expo. It's in the Fickling Centre, and this is what it looks like on a rainy day. I'm hoping it's not going to be rainy this year. I sent an email up to them and said, who's Fickling? Because the Fickling Centre is not in the suburb of Fickling, it's in the suburb of Three Kings, and I didn't think he was one of the Three Kings. I got a response back. They sent me a biography of Richard Noel Fickling and a lovely picture. And I have to say, when I walked into the Fickling Centre, that picture is in a huge gilded frame in the foyer. So I knew I was in the right place. The other thing that we've recently added to our website for members is an introductory guide to doing research outside of New Zealand. So while we're building on this collection, we've started off with the British Isles and Australia, and we also have some resources from our European interest group. We hope to build on this and build it out into further countries as people who have the research experience in those areas come forward and say, yes, Sarah, I can write those resources for you. But if you're starting your research outside of New Zealand, they're a really good place to go and look and see what's available to you. But we're not reinventing the wheel, so they are just a, a starting out guide. Now let's get on to the records that the NZSG has been collecting. We've been collecting since 1967 and we have quite a lot of them. The first one is first families. These are people that arrived in New Zealand before 1902. And this is an example of a very old first family sheet. I inherited this from my gran. She died in 1982. So what's fascinating is that uh, my cousin who filled this form in and submitted it to the NZSG, she lives down in Christchurch and when I'm down there, we stop for a cheese scone at the cafe at Turanga. They're very good cheese scones. 
So the advantage of some of these, while they might be quite old, is that they may be a generation or two closer to the source material than you are. We have a pedigree collection, which is aimed at putting you in touch with people that are searching the same names. We have a certificates collection. These have been contributed by members, so it's a rather ad hoc collection. We have approximately 130,000 of them. And recently we started a mail email service for them. Since February, when we started this service, we're guessing our members have saved about $50,000 on being able to access certificates through the certificates collection. So it's a great resource if your family's in there. We also collect pre-1856 marriages because that's when the recording of marriages became compulsory in New Zealand. We have a database on illegitimacies. We have been collecting for a number of years cemetery information. And this is not just that people are buried in the cemetery, but what is written on their headstones. So that's quite an amazing collection. We collect obituaries from newspapers and school records. School records are just wonderful things because if you know the name and the birth date of a child, then you can figure out where they were if we've managed to lay our hands on their school record and transcribed it for you. We also have started recently to collect funeral service sheets, a more modern collection that will be something that in the future will be very valuable to people down the track and it might be valuable to you now. All of these collections are indexed and added to on the Kiwi collection. This is now online. We used to do it on CD and then on USB stick. And two years ago, we got it up online. The great thing about it being online is that we're able to update it and we update it twice a year. And it has 14 million records on it as the update last month and they cover all sorts of things. Some of them are national collections where the records are covering the whole of New Zealand and others are niche to a particular area or a particular occupation. But of course, it's one of those things you don't know what you're gonna find until you go looking and there are some amazing things in there. As part of the last update, we started to put tiered access into it. So we've put, uh, we've allowed public access. So if you're not a member of the NZSG, you can access 1.4 million records. Now these are all records that are publicly available somewhere else, but they're being pulled together. So you know that they exist. And members can access 3.5 million of them. And if you subscribe, you can access all 14 million. The subscription income is a very valuable source of income to our society. So I'm just gonna give you a little example of what the different tiers are currently looking like. So remember Robert William Black, he went to Ireland. Well, this is his bride, Emily. When we look at what's available on the Kiwi collection for her, searching for Emily K, because sometimes the Kinley's in there and sometimes not, and there's a lot of Emily Blacks out there. So we can trawl through those at another time. But on the public access side, you can see that she signed the 1893 suffrage petition and that she died and left a probate. If we get into the membership access, the membership access includes our cemeteries collection. And we're hoping with our next update in December to add the images of our cemeteries collection to the Kiwi collection. And then if you are subscribed to the Kiwi collection, you get a whole lot more. And I have to say the Undertaker records were actually quite fascinating because if I hadn't had the stories about her being born in Pennsylvania, I know she got married in Ireland, but it's, it's a long story. If I hadn't, you know, if I'd been working up from me and I didn't know that she'd been born somewhere else, those Undertaker records have a lot of information about her maiden name and other information that would not be here in New Zealand because of course she married in Ireland. So I would highly recommend if you are an NZSG member that you subscribe to the Kiwi collection. It's an amazing resource. It has indexes to all the NZSG collections, including the certificates, so you know what's out there. Many of our collections are indexed, not just by the name of the person the event is about, but for example, the school records also have the parent and guardian if they're named, and our certificates have the other parties in the, um, on the certificate name, so such as parents for birth and marriage records. And the last thing I would like to promote is the New Zealand Genealogist. This is our quarterly journal and it is an amazing read. 
each quarter. Our members contribute really great stories about their families. You might learn something new. You might discover a member of the family in it. And when I've been privileged enough to be uh, printed in the genealogist, I always find someone gets in touch, whether it's to say, hey, I recognize that photo. That's a member of my family too. Or when I mentioned my great uncle, someone wrote me a beautiful email saying that they knew him and told me all about what it was like working with them. So it's another way to also reach out and find other family members. So to sum up, and I've managed to get through this presentation remarkably fast. The four key pillars of the NZSG are advocacy, community, education, and information. And we have a lot of all of those. And I hope you will, uh, if you want more information, you can have a look on our website. On our website, under the monthly presentations, there is one on our website, which gives you an indication of what you can see as a non-member and what you can see that's a lot more if you are a member. But there's a huge amount of information in there. And I'd like to do a quick promotion for the rest of Family History Month here in Wellington. So next week, we are having a presentation on DNA. The following week, we are looking at the Wellington City Library's family history resources. And on the 22nd, we will have Papers Past and Digital NZ, both of which are really useful resources for your family history. Now, for those of you that are online or those in the audience who may be traveling in the next month, there are other events around the country. There's an expo in Auckland and another expo in Christchurch. I know in Wanganui, they're planning a historical pub call and I'm kind of wishing I could get to that one. But there are events happening all over the country. And so if you happen to be in the vicinity on the day, do come along and join in. They're all on our website, both under the events calendar and the Family History Month page. Are there any questions? Ever? Yes. So we, we collect them out of the newspapers, whether or not we have them all and where they're at to in terms of transcribing them and making them available back to members is always a question mark. But yes, we do collect them out of the newspapers. Uh, excuse me, Sarah, could anybody who is asking a question in the auditorium, please use the microphone. I'm gonna ask Anne if she would. <laughs> ask a question then. Well, could you take it to the next person then? So I can yes, of course. Uh, your certificate collection. Yes. Do you only collect New Zealand certificates or can I give you my English ones as well? We do try to have ones that have a New Zealand con connection. But yes, we do have certificates from all over the world in the certificates collection. Okay. Just trying to downsize. <laughs> That's another presentation. We'll do that in one next. <laughs> another question. Oh no, stunned into silence, and I'm so fast. Down here. But just hang on a sec. I'm bringing the microphone. Just because we're on Zoom, it means that the people at home can hear what you're saying. <laughs> um, when you talk about certificates, could you elaborate? Certificates for what? What does that uh, Births, deaths, and marriages. Oh. We also collect, oh, intentions to marry, uh, apprenticeship documents. Basically, if it's a certificate in any way, shape, or form, uh, we collect them. And, and we have many, many other you know collections of information that we are slowly you know they're sitting in the library some of them we're slowly moving towards you know indexing further i know greta one of our board members here has a big thing about shipping lists she really wants us to move into shipping lists <laughs> sarah i have an online question and if anyone online can hear me which I hope they can, um, we will also encourage people to add to the Q&A uh, online for further questions. But the question is one that I can answer, but I'll ask in this room so other people know. Will recordings of these four National Library presentations be available after each event? So I can answer that. 
on, Joan. I, I'm Joan McCracken from the Alexander Turnbull Library. And yes, they will be, but they won't be available immediately. So it takes us a little while to process those um, presentations. They all have to be transcribed uh, before they can go up on a government website. So yes, but not yet. Okay. Thank you, Joan. Anything else coming through in the Q&A up there? Any other questions from the floor? Up the back there? If you find something that's grossly in error, like passenger lists in papers past, how do you get it corrected? Uh, in terms of the text that's put on, um, you will need to ask the papers past team when they come here at, yeah, on the 22nd, but I do believe that text correction is coming. I don't know when. My four birds came out on the Edward and Fox and in papers past or shipping list, they left it, left the boat in Brest, France, because it got smashed up. And uh, <coughs> they must have arrived because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. No, um, so it will be very fascinating. I, I would encourage everybody to come along to the Papers Past and Digital NZ. I mean, I personally have gotten a lot of value out of their resources over the years, and I'm sure there will be other people here that have as well. Cool. And and they'll be able to tell you what they're what they're doing next. I have two questions. Yep. Um, the first of these is: Are there people who specialise in Māori ancestry? My late husband's distant relative has not been traceable. Right, so the NZSG has a Maori interest group and they're probably the best people to start talking to. I appreciate that Maori research is different to Pākehā research and that there is a huge oral tradition there and the best place to start, of course, is on your marae. But if, if you don't know where your marae is, then talking to someone like the Maori interest group, they'll be able to help you out. And you can find them on our website. And my last question at the moment is, how much does it cost to join the NCST? <laughs> the $50 million question. It's not $50 million, unfortunately. We do a lot with $50 million. No, uh, it's $112 a year for an individual. And I can't remember the rest of them. We also have a joint membership for two adults living at the same address and a student membership for those who are 25 and under who are studying. So. And the Kiwi collection is $50 a year or $20 a month. Well, do you have any um, programs or, um, you know, sessions for training or giving advice on using software programs for you recording your own family history? We don't as yet. Uh, quite often the advice we give is to find your local branch because then you'll find an expert in your local branch that knows how to use that software and we'll be able to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and give you the help that you need to work out how to do it. I do know that Capity Branch up the coast, they run a lot of um, groups on different types of software. Which one do you use? Oh, okay. That's always the hard part, picking which one. You'll probably get about 10 different answers, wouldn't you? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I like to liken it to religion, but other people have suggested children that you know everybody uh, likes their own best um, and so it is really a case of software of, of just trying them out and seeing if that's the way your head works for putting the information in and if you don't like it moving on to the next one and and seeing there's a lot of free versions or trial versions out there to give you that chance to try them out the trick is to find one that uses jet match GED match. No, JEDCOM. No, not JEDCOM. Sorry, JEDCOM, <laughs> not JED match. Thinking DNA. DNA. JEDCOM. Yeah. Because I, then whatever you've typed in, you can transfer to something else if you don't like the one you're using. It is the whole the whole keeping yourself organized thing is is really down to yourself and you know everybody's life experiences shape how they keep themselves organized. You know, if you've been in a work environment where things are done in a certain way, then you might transfer that to your genealogy. If you've been in a work environment where there's been no filing required, and I very much envy you, you know, you just, you just need to figure it out for yourself. I mean, there's a lot of advice out there on pretty much everything, 
but like with most advice, you need to see if it works for you or not. I have more. Good. Um, somebody asked with a, a question about interest groups. Are there any Pacific interest groups? I've been trying to find out more about records in Fiji. At the moment, we do not have a Pacific interest group uh, going, but it is something that we need to look at in terms of what we could do online, because uh, depending on where people are, there may or may not be enough people. But I'll definitely write that down on my list of things to start looking at. Um, I could say that the National Library, the Turnbull Library, does have a research guide uh, for Pacific genealogical research. So I could put that link in. Yeah, in and, and soon. Family Search is often a good website to look at for um, Pacific records. Because And somebody has offered this information. JETCOM is a standard for transferring data from one program to another. Every decent genealogical program will know what to do with a JEDCOM file and be able to produce one. Exactly. So if it doesn't, you know it's not a good one. And on on Wiki, if you if you Google genealogy programs Wikipedia, Wikipedia have a really good list of ones and the different operating systems. Because of course, one of the things these days is that you know you have your laptop or your desktop computer that's Windows and your iPad and your Android phone. Although if you have an iPad, you probably have an iPhone, but you know, it's transferring the information between those various things. So you have it to hand because it's always a good idea to have your family tree to hand. I know I sit in our presentations and people start talking about things and I go, lay in my tray, get out my phone, have a quick look. So yes or no. So yeah, because you never know when you might run into somebody you're related to. While Anne is going to another question, I've got one last one. Do you recommend being a member of Ancestry as well, as, or is this duplication of information? I don't want to get myself in trouble with Ancestry, but when you're starting out in New Zealand, you really don't need to belong to any of the commercial subscription websites because the records that they have are relatively few to what you're starting out. You're going to be buying certificates because that's, we don't have, civil registration has been for most of the time that we Pākehā have been in New Zealand. So you're gonna be paying the DIA or if you've got it on our collection, getting it for free as a member. Ancestry do have electoral rolls and street directories, which are very, very useful. But unless you're researching other areas, it might be just easier to come into places like the National Library that have Ancestry to look at those. Once you get outside of New Zealand, then you need to see what the site you're about to subscribe to has in the way of records that you need. Um, I, I found it quite interesting when I was getting to some of my DNA and tracking a branch down to Devon that on Ancestry, all these trees ran out about 1800 because that's when census information stopped. Because at that point, all the records for Devon were on Find My Past and people had picked Ancestry over that one to subscribe to. So it's really very much a case of doing your research and checking that the records you want are on the database that you're paying for. But here in New Zealand, there's a lot of records that are, are not on Ancestry and we hold a lot. But Sarah, for some of the public who might be here tonight and don't belong to a branch, I wonder if you might like to perhaps just speak and put on the record the branches here and when and where they meet. And if that's a big challenge, the other three conveners are here and I'm sure Anne can whip around the microphone. Shall we start with Hutt Valley or you start? I'll start with Kilburnie Branch because we do have the conveners for the other three branches here. So Kilburnie Branch meets at Akotangi, which used to be known as the ASB Sports Centre. We meet on the first Thursday of the month. Our doors open at 9 a.m. and our meeting starts at 10. So we have a speaker each time and access to our resources, which is our library. And we have various things on microfiche as well and some laptops with other things on them. We have a lot of stuff. They all fit into two very small cupboards though. Um, we also do a research morning on the third Wednesday of the month, which is either Akutangi using our library and resources, or we go for a trip somewhere to see something interesting. Last month we went to Wellington Museum, which was quite interesting to see some of the new things there. Um, 
But yeah, so that's my branch at Colburny. I would like to point out that also, I meant to say it in the presentation, but I kind of forgot. Uh, I walked into Colburny with a six month old baby. <laughs> I had asked, I will point this out. But for those of you that might be watching at home or know people that are younger and think that a, a branch is a sort of scary thing because it might be full of old people. Um, you know, I've had a wonderful time at Colburny Branch. I've made some great friends. And while I might be, you know, young enough to be their daughter, um, I'm not the youngest one that's ever been there. And, um, you know, it's always been great value being the member of a branch. So I'm gonna pass on to Helene, who is the convener of the Hutt Valley Branch. Good evening, I'm Helene Philpot. I'm the convener of the Hutt Valley Branch. We meet on the third Thursday of the month at the Petone Masonic Hall in 65 Udy Street in Petone. Uh, meetings are evening meetings, and we have another morning research book for Friday, the 6th of October, I think the date is. You'd have to have a look at our website. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm Pat Liddell. I'm the convener of the Porro branch. We meet on the second Wednesday evening of the month at the Helen Smith. Helen, <laughs> sounded wrong. The Helen Smith room at Partica, which is adjacent to the Porro City Library, where you will find a wonderful collection of genealogical research material, including the ancestry by my past. 1921 census and we have volunteers from our branch who go and help people to find out what they need to know so uh, seven for 7 30 on the second wednesday of the month at the helen smith room partica thank you thank you pat i'm heading towards the person who might join us and um, this is our newest convener Geraldine, who's been a convener for what, weeks now? Just weeks, yes. <laughs> Kia ora everyone. Uh, I'm Geraldine Needham Gervin and I'm uh, the new convener of the Wellington Group. Um, so our Wellington branch meets actually in Johnsonville at the Collective Community Hub, which is in Johnsonville Road uh, on the third Wednesday of every month, starting at 7 for 7.30. Uh, we have um, a speaker come to um, talk to us at each of um, those events and uh, we also have a library of books available. Thank you. So and for those who are watching that might be further afield, have a look at the NZSG website to find your nearest branch. We have them all over the place. Oh, Sarah, um, might be a bit deep and meaningful this question, but it's been eating away at me for the past year. I've just been uh, going into this whole thing for about just over a year and a roller coaster. And now I'm starting to think I'm going to have, I'm going to enter all this data. I've found out an awful lot about a whole lot of branches and I'm still entering data. And if I get run over by a bus on the way home tonight, what is going to happen to all the work that I've done? How do you pass on the mantle? What happens? You, you get Rodney <laughs> <laughs> to come and do a presentation to you. So, I mean, my personal view is that the best thing you can leave is a well-sourced GEDCOM, which is a file out of a family history program that points people to where you know, you found the information that has made up your family tree. I would also think about putting things that are irreplaceable in, in some sort of, you know, good archival box with a note on it saying, this is irreplaceable, do not throw it away. Because we've all heard stories about, you know, diaries or letters or pictures that have all just disappeared when somebody has passed away. And I think it's really important that we make sure that we, you know, label the originals. We also have the option these days of digitizing quite a lot. And you can uh, decide to put that online on one of the myriad of online trees that are out there. Um, most of them are free to access. They just, yeah, usually they want money for added on things. Um, 
but it, yeah, it's really important to well source things as someone who is really bad at it. Shouldn't be telling what I should be doing it too. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's the important thing to do. Joan, you've got another question? Not a question, but a couple of resources people have pointed to, so I'd like mm -hmm. to share those. Um, one is the research wiki on family search, which uh, our person here says is excellent place to find out about searching a new place. Yeah, definitely. And that Eleanor Fowler is an expert in Māori and Pacifica genealogy, and she has several excellent presentations on YouTube. Yes, um, Eleanor did our monthly presentation a few days ago, last Thursday. And so when I get around to editing the video, it will be up on the NZSG website with a link to her YouTube channel. She's got some really great resources out there and is very knowledgeable on Maori DNA and whakapapa research. So, now, do we have another question down there? Or did you have a question? question? No, have we run out of questions? All right, well, I, I will say thank you all for coming along tonight. It's been great for you all to come out on a Tuesday evening when the weather forecast was looking a bit dodgy. And uh, I also like to say a big thank you to the National Library for hosting us over Family History Month. The auditorium is a beautiful space and we're very grateful to have access to it. I'll just put back up on the screen the slide of the other presentations that we're having this month and I hope to see you all there. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to find out more information about the New Zealand Society of Genealogists or our many branches around the country, please see our website www.genealogy.org.nz.